Hey there, thank you for stopping by on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to find out more about Lara's Church Secunda, or hoping to find a sermon to listen to, you're in the right place. We upload content weekly, so come back regularly for any updates, or click the subscribe button below, and let us let you know when new content has been uploaded. For more information, visit our website at www.lighthousechurch.co.za. Thanks once again for stopping by. So we're in a series where we're working through the Ten Commandments and how the Ten Commandments fit into our everyday lives. It's not about living under the law, it's about living under grace. But what do the Ten Commandments mean to us today? Is it a code of conduct? Is it a law that we have to live by? Is it taking Jesus and adding the Ten Commandments to Jesus, does it make Jesus better? No. So if you're fully in Jesus, why would we need the Ten Commandments? So we're looking at what do the Ten Commandments mean to us and how do they apply to us? Last week, or not last week, when we started the series, we're on week two now, when we started the series, I started off when we started about how the Israelites had been in just the most horrific environment for 400 years. They'd been slaves, having no culture, having no understanding of who they are in Christ or in God, not having even met Christ yet. They had no idea who they were. They served false gods. They had pagan rituals. They had all these pagan habits. And God brings them out supernaturally. He brings them out after they have an encounter with God's power. He brings them out. And then God shows His goodness and glory. He has them see how He's powerful enough to actually get Pharaoh to change his mind. He, God shows how generous and gracious He is by parting the Red Sea so they can go through. They have all these encounters. And now God says, I want to teach you my ways. I want to teach you who I am. These are my standards Moses goes up Mount Sinai as the Israelite nation stays at the base. And God gives Moses the Ten Commandments and the law. First one, God says, I'm your God. Look at what I've done for you. Look how I've set you free. Look how I've provided for you. I'm your God. One out of ten. Today we pursue two out of ten. If we can go, that one thing, that one, he's our God. If I can pursue that, one out of ten. But you're on your way. Today we look at the second one, two out of ten. Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I pray you'll anoint my mouth to speak your oracles, anoint our ears to hear what you have to say. I pray, Lord God, that the word will grip us and change us so that when we leave here, we're different, more like Jesus, and pursuing your presence. Whatever is in our lives that needs to be removed, I pray, Lord God, that as your word is spoken, your Holy Spirit will loosen those things and set us free. We bless you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. God says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity. So, Listen to this. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. God compares worshiping anything else as hatred towards him. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. I must I ever say this. A couple of years ago, we had a person in the church. They went to one of my pastors and said, this church practiced paganism. So you go, well, how do you figure that? You have carved, image in your, carved, carved images in your home. So I was intrigued. I thought, what carved images are we bringing into our home? She goes, she says to us, you're bringing Easter bunnies and Easter eggs into your houses. You're worshipping them. Now, I haven't, I haven't worshipped chocolate since I was about five. <laughs> so one of my pastors stands there and he goes, I agree with you. I will not tolerate the Easter eggs in my house. I get rid of them as soon as my wife brings them in. I eat them. <laughs> Sometimes we can get a bit weird about these things. But I don't want to offend anyone today. I'm going to pursue not offending a single person today. So I'm just going to read a whole lot of scripture and let God do the work. Let me show you what happens. When we mess with things made. Well, let me read. 1 Samuel chapter 5. 
When the Philistines captured the ark of God, which represents the presence of God, it had the presence of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Dagon was the Philistine fish dude. It was their main god. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of God. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. So he had fallen down, worshipping God, even the idol. When they arose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold, right at the entrance. It's as if Dagon tried to make a run for it. And God took off his head and hands. Only the trunk, the body of Dagon, was left to him. So I'm going to make this statement. Whatever you make your idol, God will destroy. Whatever your idol is, God will deal with it. Idol worship is dangerous for the idol. It's just scripture. I will not offend today. So while this is happening... Not the Dagon thing. While God is giving Moses the law, look at what the Israelites are doing in Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed, so Moses takes his time because he's busy with God, to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So they trusted man but doubted timing. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold and that are in your ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Don't have your sons have earrings. Anyway, um, so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron and he received the gold from their hand. This is the guy that's the spokesperson of Moses. He speaks on behalf of Moses, uh, Moses on behalf of God, and he does this. He received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are the gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Isn't that amazing? God says to Moses, I'm not going to read all this text. God then says to Moses, Dude, go back down. The people you brought out of Egypt, making nonsense. Moses is like, People I brought out of Egypt, you sent me. Go down. He goes down, he sees, and he hears this jewel. There's the party of note. He doesn't know if it's war. He doesn't know if it's party. He gets there, and they're all dancing around worshiping this golden calf. Moses loses it. He breaks the tablet. And uh, it is the first, you know, it, it's really a sign for preachers. You need to get the message from God, which will be on a tablet that you'll download from the cloud. Moses makes them burn this golden calf until it becomes like powder. must have been really cheap gold. And then he mixes it with water and makes them drink it. It's absolute chaos. Moses sorts them out. So, I don't have a golden calf at home. I don't have one. But are the only idols we're busy with, are they all golden calves? Let's see. I was watching TV the other day, and a show came on about religious fanatics. And they were crazy. Well, they weren't crazy if you understand their cultures and religions. You see, the thing is, they were worshippers of idols, and they took things to the extreme. They painted their bodies, they wore these ridiculous costumes, they chanted, they danced, they made sacrifices to their idols. They built these enormous temples to worship their idols. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try this again. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced. They made sacrifices to their idols. They built these enormous temples to worship their idols. 
It seemed like the entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship, it's not about golden calves anymore. Don't lose your minds. Sport's fine. You can watch your sport. You can do your thing. It's an illustration. I can just see, I can read your minds. I'm never coming back again. I'm going to go watch rugby. <laughs> what are we substituting in our lives? What is our idol? Is your idol money? So when you talk about money in the church, all of a sudden, now you listen. And they go, yes, they talk about money in the church every single Sunday. No, if you came more than three times a year, you'd notice that we only speak about it three times a year. If I say to you that it's sacrificial, generous giving, more than 10% of your total income is a basic tithe that you give to the church, plus there's offerings, plus there's giving to the poor, plus there's giving even more, and you go, you, you see, you know, pastor, I don't tithe per se, because all of a sudden you're clever because you've got a bit of French. I don't tithe, I tithe my time. Well, I'd like you to go and try that at Pick and Pay. You go, you buy your groceries, they say, um, so, okay, those four items, it's 3,980 rand, and you go, I'm, I'm not going to pay with money, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pay with my time. The manager will come and say, yes, that's correct, it'll be three to five years. <laughs> if I speak about money, is there something in you that goes, I speak about giving money to the poor. You go, yeah, but they're going to buy booze. You buy booze. But I don't know what they're going to do with their money. God doesn't know what you're going to do with your money, but he trusts you with it. Do you worry about money? How much do you worry about money? No, no, you, it's not your... I, I'll move on. I don't want that topic to offend you. Your career... You focus on your career. If I can just become an O, L, N. Because you guys all come with these acronyms. I don't understand what you're saying either. If I can just become the VP, the SVP, the oh my gosh, I almost want to pee. I want to do something. <laughs> can I just, if I can become that person, then, I, then my life will be complete. If I can just do that. If I can just make it to the next run on the ladder. If I can just make it to the next promotion. If your whole focus is becoming promoted, you're putting your little career there as a small little idol. God can use me once I've been promoted. Family, wait, I'm pursuing my career. Church, wait, I'm pursuing my career. Living out your call as God has called you to. No, wait, I'm, I'm busy pursuing my career. Yes, but career is good. So is gold and so are calves. Gold is amazing. God loves gold. He's paved the streets in heaven with him. God loves gold. Cattle. It says that the cattle on a thousand hill all belong to God. He's all right with cattle. He's all right with gold. He's all right with you having careers. But is your life consumed by your career? But I don't want to offend, so I'll move on. Maybe your appearance. Do you spend more time in front of the mirror than you do in the Word of God? Got to wake up early because I've got to make this look something else. So I get up an hour earlier so I can groom my hair. You're all looking at the bald guy saying that. <laughs> but it's good to wash. Less people will sit near you if you don't. It's good to be clean. It's good to brush your hair. It's good to be neat. But has your appearance got you? It's a good thing, but so are calves and so is gold. But if I'm prettier, he'll like me. If I dress smarter, I'll get the girl. Sorry, I don't want to offend you. I'll go on. Love. Love is a good thing. If God can just get me a wife. If you're praying more for your wife than you are seeing for the kingdom come, maybe there's something you've put as your idol. I'm not praying for your wife. praying that you'll actually one day get a wife. Remember, guys, basic rules. Get a job, read the Bible, get a car, clean your fingernails, you'll get someone. Ladies, find a guy with a car, he's got a job, and a car and cleans his fingernails, you have found someone. <laughs> Do we pursue sexual satisfaction above pursuing his presence? 
do we pursue love by man that others will like us? People say, I don't care what people think of me. That's a lie. You have an old car, you tint the windows. It's for safety. Nobody in a Ferrari tints its windows. Because you want people to see in. That we don't have that. I don't want to speak about that because I'm, I'm scared that topic may offend you. Have you made your stuff your idol? Your car, your house, those pair of jeans. If I can just get a holiday home, if I can just pay my house off. They're good things, friends. If I can just have that watch. And I'm just a neat freak. I'm not OCD, but God forbid I go to sleep while they're still dirty washing. They're dirty dishes, I can't sleep. I go to bed at night, I think, are there dirty dishes? I don't care. <laughs> My wife goes to sleep, Derek, dirty dishes again. I don't care. My stuff will not determine my happiness. It's your stuff. If your stuff, if your car, if you have an old car, but if you get a new car and you think that's going to make you happy, but if I get a newer one and better stuff, if you think it's going to make you happy, you're finding your happiness in something that you're pursuing, whatever you pursue, you worship. Has it become your idol? Mm. But I don't want to offend. Maybe it's your activities. I'm stressed. I need to just go for a run. I'm heartbroken. I need to have a gym session. Your hobby. I need to put together this little plastic aircraft and paint it and go, because I'm 45. Because <laughs> if I can just do that, then I'll have peace in my life. If I can just get the latest Transformers, Jigamaboo's thingamabob, then I'm happy. My family will be complete. I'm classified as full-on nerd. If you need an activity to unwind and make your day better, you have lost the focus. Or food. When I'm sad, I have chocolate. When I'm happy, well, we celebrate with chocolate. When I'm not too sure what I'm feeling, just to be sure, we have chocolate. Eating disorders, whether it's too much or too little, is the food become a crutch? I don't want to offend you. I'll move on. But let me say this. Sport will not change your kid's life. A good book besides the book, will not make your life better. A holiday probably won't solve your problems. I want to encourage you dads, if you only go on holiday when you're tired, all you're giving your children is your worst time. Take your kids on holiday when you're at your best and at your freshest and ready to give them the best holiday ever. Then you can take them anywhere. You can take them to the duck pond. They'll have an amazing time with dad. But if you always wait until you're so exhausted that all they're getting is this corpse with a little bit of a pulse, you can take them to Disneyland and they're having no time with dad. Be a good dad. What drives us to idol worship? What drives us to make these things our idols? It's the eye. It's the eye in idol. It's our impatience. We make money our idol because we can't manage finances. We cannot save, so we take out a loan to buy the car because the stuff will make us happy. We don't have the patience to wait for the right girl, so we just go for any girl. We don't have the patience to wait for the right guy, so we marry an unsaved guy and our life is hell. We don't have the patience to finish what God has called us to. We don't have the patience to be in church long enough and to stay long enough that you can get offended and you can be restored and you can be healed, that you can step into your calling. If you can just stop being impatient, please. That's what drove the Israelites to have their golden calf. We couldn't wait for Moses anymore. I want to offend now. Stop being impatient. Stop making your time God's time. 
I will change jobs. Friends, I'm speaking from experience. I'll do it my way. God is blessing me. No, God has to try and control you and constantly teach you a lesson, not out of punishment, but out of development, because we're impatient. Have you seen small little children when they get impatient? Hmm, it's a joy. Incompleteness. Oh, I need somebody to make me whole. We write these letters, you make me whole. I hate you. You're my everything. I'm leaving you. You're my world. You need meds. If I was taller, if I was shorter, if I was thinner, if I was bigger, if I was younger, if I was older, if I, if, if, if I was something else, I'd be in ministry and I'd tell people about Jesus and I'd pursue God with everything that's in me. But I'm not complete, so I can't serve him, but I'll serve my idol. Independence. I love this independence stuff. I'll do what I need to do and God can bless later. I'll be independent. I don't, I don't want to go to God with every problem. I don't want to go to God only when I have a problem. I'll go to God when I can't figure it out. So I change jobs every four months. I change girlfriends every four weeks. Underpants six weeks, but... <laughs> David did that. King David, the king of Israel. Probably the of the best military strategists ever. There's a big giant that an army can't take on, so I'll take some stones and my sling. Probably the best leader ever. If you want to get taken captive, David, his men tried to kill him. So not the shining star, but God says, this is a man after my own heart. David has success after success after success until he becomes independent of what God's called him to, and he stops being a fighter, and he starts hanging around the palace. It says, and in that season that all the men went to war, David was standing on his balcony. You see, the season that you're in needs to be a time of war, not with your family, but pursuing what God has called you to, and it's a battle because we have an enemy. We ha Do you understand that you're in a battle? God wouldn't give us the armor of God if we were having picnics for a living. So he says, will you please be dependent on me? And David has an attitude. I will do what I want to do. This is my season of rest. And that's when he has an affair with Bathsheba. He actually rapes a woman, gets her pregnant, kills her husband, so that he's not caught out. When you stop being dependent on God, you'll make something else your idol. When you stop being dependent on God, oh, wait, 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 I might be retrenched. I'm going to lose my income. God will provide. God will use a petrol jockey who possibly for the whole day only made 50 rand. And God will use him to show you that he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory because God is able to do so. Or oh, our little insecurities. I can't speak. I'm not brave enough. I'm not a good enough mom. Probably the, of the biggest lies told to the children of God and to moms today is that you're not good enough. Do something else, you'll be better. It started with Eve in the Garden of Eden when the devil said to her, this will make you something else. You have been robbed. Our little insecurities force us to create little idols in our lives. If I play sport well, if I'm the best why is it always I? When you start understanding, I can rest in God, trust His timing. No more impatient. When I can trust Him to make me complete. When I can trust Him that I find my security in Him. I cannot remember who it was. I, really, I forget his name now. Second service will get the name. But there's a, an amazing man of God. I really wish I knew his name. I think it was Finney who was being interviewed, and the person interviewing him mocks him and says, aren't you just a shoemaker? You claim to be raising the dead, and he, aren't you just a shoemaker? And he sat there stunned. He says, no, 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 not at all. No, I'm, I'm not a shoemaker. I'm not that good. I can only fix shoes. Now all of a sudden, the interviewer didn't know what to say to him. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter what my insecurities are. It doesn't matter what my inabilities are. Well, I can't speak. Yes, you can. 
I don't have the confidence. Can we stop living a life that everything else is our idol? It's not about golden calves. It's about what you spend your time focusing on. It's about what you spend your time worrying about. It's about what you spend your time thinking about. And who you find your safety in. Let's pray. Well, as I close this morning, I spoke about he needs to be our God or you're going to have other idols. Now, most of the people sitting in this room has given their life to Jesus at some stage. But we cannot end this meeting without me inviting you to give your life to the one who died for you, the one who was destroyed for you. It's not about how you've grown up. It's about who you've, who you've put your faith and trust in. If you're sitting out this morning, and I'm not going to drag this out at all, but if you're sitting out this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, you are not born again. And you could have spent your life in church if you've never given your life to Jesus. You are not born again, and you must be born again. Those are the words of Jesus. You have to be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit to receive eternal life. So I'm asking this morning, if you're seated here, perhaps standing at the back, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never made a commitment that He'd be your Lord and Savior, you may have been sitting in church for 50 years. Friend, you have to give your life to Jesus. I want to ask you, if that's you this morning, if you can raise your hands so that I can pray with you. If there's anyone here this morning, you may be the only one here. You're the only one I'm speaking to then. I don't see any hands raised. If you have raised your hand, you have to swing it around a bit. Then I'm working on the assumption as I'm praying now that I've got a room full of people that have given their lives to Jesus at some stage. So I want to ask you this morning, have you learned to trust Him completely? Perhaps you're lacking faith. The opposite of faith is not unbelief, it's fear. Perhaps you need, we prayed for breakthroughs already, but do you need to have a mindset change on who your provider is? It's not your boss. God chose to use them. Do you understand that your health that you have is from God? God can use a doctor, but it's his prerogative. He'll choose them. Perhaps your relationships have been destroyed because you've made it your God. Perhaps there's something that has become an idol in your life and has been destroyed, and you don't know why. Because every idol will bow to God. God will not tolerate idols. I'm not going to ask you to respond because I believe every one of us has to respond in some way. And this is not a preach for the person next to you or behind you. It's a preach for you. We have things creep into our lives. There are things that have become idols. There are things that create fear. There are things that we pursue. They may be good things. So is gold. So are calves. But have they taken the place of our king. Let me give you a few seconds, you think about it. And in your mind, you start laying those things down. What consumes your thought, your time, what makes you scared? So Lord, I pray this over every person over here this morning. Our focus will be you, our pursuit will be your presence. We will not fear what the enemy has planned for us because we know your word says that you have good plans for us, plans to prosper us. We will not fear. We will not doubt. Lord, I pray where patience is needed in people's lives because they need, they're waiting for the breakthrough. They're waiting for the spouse. They're waiting for their jobs. They're waiting. I pray, Lord God, give us patience. Where we are insecure, I pray, Holy Spirit, bring that security so that we can rest in your comfort. And Lord, where... Breakthrough is needed. We pray, Lord, bring it quickly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.